Hey guys, welcome to Mentality Unchained. Uh, this episode is going to be a little bit different. Um, I had an opportunity to um, attend a panel discussion about ethnic notion. Tony Turner, thank you for inviting me, man. This panel discussed the stereotypes that is plaguing our black communities in America today. Uh, one of the things that I noticed that we had a lot of young people there that were really, really in depth in the discussion of race, in the discussion of ethnicity, in the discussion of race-based trauma. And one of the things that I wanted to bring to the table as a licensed professional therapist, and I want you guys to start to push our young people to speak out more, to be uh, brave in who they are, to understand who they are, and to promote their blackness, to also promote that their strength is not in their colors, it is in their in intellectual uh, being and I ask that you continue to uplift them. And if you want to get the full effect again, go and watch Ethnic Notion on YouTube. All right, thank you all for, first of all, thank you all for coming to uh, view the film and listen to the discussion that we are having today about stereotypes. Um, the title of this discussion panel is I Am Not Your Stereotype. I am Tony Turner, founder of Conscious Coaching, and we will go down the line and let everyone introduce themselves and what they do and who they're here representing today. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Dennis Littlejohn. Um, I am the president of uh, NAACP U, and I also help uh, facilitate with UCU over at Washington Park. Hi, everyone. I'm Tajiana James. Um, I'm a part of the NAACP, and I am here with UCU. All right, what's going on, everybody? Uh, I'm Kyle Muhammad, and I'm also a UCU representative. I'm a participant. My name is Timberland Turner. Uh, I'm representing UCU. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Stephen Marshall. I'm a school counselor. Um, I'm representing Conscious Coaching with my bro. Hi, I'm Kanaya Collins, and um, I'm a member of the NAACP, and I'm also representing UCU. Hi, I'm Kevin Thomas. I'm a licensed professional therapist, and I'm representing Mentality Unchained. Okay, so first question, we'll go down the line. After watching Ethnic Notions, give me one word to describe how you feel and why. Um, I felt uncomfortable um, the whole time. Well, not the whole time. Well, the whole time I felt uncomfortable, and it was a moment in the beginning where my heart was like just racing. Um, just in total disbelief, you know. Um, shocked. Um, and also like, yeah, I have to, disappointed, like, cause you know, it's still stuff going on like this today. Uh, I feel more of, um, Kind of like like shocked in a way, and because it's it's interesting to see how you know those images were definitely real, and white people definitely did blackface, and it was just like how could that even cross their mind? And it was just like it was interesting to see how all that went down and how they viewed us as a people. Um, I want to say irritated because to see like where they started to depict our features from the beginning and you would like see how it affected us now. 
Um, for me, I would say saddened just to see the lengths that uh, people went through to try to control the narrative and create certain narratives about who we are as a people. Um, I would say I'm aggravated because seeing what, how it like originated and what everything happened, how it just wasn't public or really known and just seeing how it recycles and it's just a cycle and how it still goes on in today in just different forms, it's really aggravating. I will say for me, disappointed um, because just like this young lady, it continues but in a different form and uh, we have to find a way to uh, move it past that stage. Okay, this question is just for the youth, the first round, and then the adults and the therapist. How do you see stereotypes affecting African American youth just the African-American community itself in general, negative stereotypes, how does it affect us? Um, I would say um, you already feel like a target when you walk into the room and like um, people already expect these things out of you. They expect you to act a certain way, talk a certain way, look a certain way. And um, I feel like once you speak until these negative stereotypes until children, they'll start to believe it and act like that also. Uh, I believe that the stereotypes destroy our confidence, like if you know what I mean, because, you know, it's something that majority of us experience in every field in our lives, like whether we're in sports or whether in education or in a job. I feel like the way that you're percepted by other people, especially white people, that it will destroy the, like the confidence that you give off into that environment, so. Um, I feel like it affects like mental state and how you uh, tend to process things because you get, uh, you have this like built up opinion of negative attributes that they depict of you. So when it comes to um, noticing stuff within your own race or with people who are similar to you, you already have this negative um, outlook because that's what you like are used to and that's where your mental state is. Um, I want to say before I even answer the question, when we talk about stereotypes in the black community, there's really only negative ones that's really known or that we talk about. There's never really positive stereotypes in the black community. So with that being said, I feel like the youth, we take upon these stereotypes because they're just everywhere and wherever we go, there's these stereotypes and it like embeds in our skin and our soul and we just react and we just live through these stereotypes without even realizing it. I love her. She's amazing. Um, so for the adults and the therapist, can you give a broken down, as, as Jay-Z say, dumb it down, um, a clinical definition of what's actually taking place by constantly seeing um, irrational and negative depictions of African Americans, Blacks, Moors, however we want to be identified, but can you explain the, from a mental standpoint the depiction and how it relates? Um, well, I, w I would basically, I mean, they, they kind of explained it, you know what I mean? They, they, they really explained it, but really it's just, it comes to like internalization. You know, you see um, yourself every, every, every time, like this young lady said, every time I turn the TV on, if I only see myself um, in a negative light, after a while I'll begin to internalize that. Um, like you see the, these folks that they were showing up here, um, shown as savages, or then they try to change the narrative as noble savages, but that's all that you see of yourself. After a while, if that's all that you see of yourself when you turn your TV on or whatever, you turn on to entertain yourself, and then you have people, whenever you step into a space that's controlled by white people and they're treating you as that, you just begin to internalize that. Um, and when I say internalize that, it's just you kind of begin to believe it. It may not be true, but you perceive it to be true and you start to act on it as if it is true. So that's the main thing I see from a mental standpoint. I just see internalization. Um, 
as far as when, what they were going through back in the 1800s and stuff is maybe obviously some survival in that. Like, you know what I mean? They see themselves like maybe they have to do these certain things to survive. But I think the current day is just a lot of internalization. What I see with the youth, um, probably what I've been through as a youth, trying to basically internalize the things that you see. Um, but it all goes back to, like this young lady said, you internalizing their negative stereotypes. Wow, Steve. Um, I would like to say, first of all, it's really brave of these young folks to be up here talking about these deep issues because as adults, we have yet to come to terms with a lot of these deep issues that you guys are continuing to deal with. Uh, I will say from a therapist standpoint, um, this bring up a lot of historical, intergenerational, and also race-based trauma. And this really feeds into a psychological impact that we have on our minds and the way we see things and the way we look at people and our self-image of ourselves. And so I think the implications that it gives us is the fact that we have to adhere to uh, the stereotypes, but we don't. You know, we can make our own lane, we can create our own lane, even though when we step into the room, uh, the white people or the other races may look at us differently. We don't have to be that. And so until we start to change that, and I think we're in a generation now that our young people are really trying to take a hold of that and actually move it forward. Okay. Self-hate so, too. I'll oh, go ahead. It's not a clinical term, but self-hate, I think it, I think it that definitely breeds self-hate if you constantly see yourself in a negative image. If that's the only thing you see yourself negative, I think you begin to um, get self-hate within yourself. And that could, again, uh, show itself in a lot of different ways within yourself and within your life. You have anything you want to add? Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, going down the line again, do you feel that images and stereotypes, negative stereotypes, how do you feel they play a role in the treatment of African Americans from people of other ethnicities? To me, it's like, They don't know what to expect, you know, sort of like, are you going to, do you like watermelon? Do you like chicken? You know, or, um, you know, do you, it's just like, what, what, what do you, it's a lot of, what do you expect? If I'm answering, why did you understand that? Um, I feel like that they, um, they, I have to agree with Dennis. They don't know what to expect, and um, also they kind of already e expect us not to expect us, but they already know. Like, and then when people, you know, feed into these stereotypes, they be like, "I, I knew it. Typical, typical, you know," and it's very harmful. I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question, please? So, basically, how the how do you think? The, these negative um, stereotypes that are per portrayed on TV, social media, how do you think that, or what role does that play in other ethnicities or other cultures looking at African American, Black, Moorish people? I mean, I believe that in a way it's kind of like, um, it's, it's, it's like, it's, they expect it to, you know, like they, what they see, especially the way that we're being depicted, it's like that's where they get the generalization that, you know, that's actually the way that we are and that the stereotypes are actually true and, then, you know, it, yeah, it just gives them that percep perception of us, like. You're good. I want to say when it comes to other races or ethnicities viewing a uh, black race is that there is a stereotype because the only thing that they genuinely know is what they've seen on social media or the things that surround them. And so there's a lack of communication and a lack of understanding each other's differences and 
what um, and like the understanding of what it is like to be black. And so, so many people have these um, these opinions and actions that they carry out with the thought of them understanding what it is to be black, but they don't have a genuine understanding that's true. So then when they do gather the information or they do clarify with communication, it's like a shell shock type thing. And it's a sudden realization like, oh, I didn't know that. And then um, I just feel like it's a lack of communication between the two. Um, I think basically it's like, I look at it as like, in a lot of instances, it's their introduction to us and our culture. Because a lot of the world is still segregated, very much so. So a lot of white people, they first time uh, understanding us or getting a, a peek into our culture is through television, is through movies, is through music, is through social media, YouTube, or whatever. Um, and again, a reference her again, a lot of times those images are negative. So, and we, we probably still dealing with a lot of people who are treating us based on how their grandparents raised them, who was viewing stuff like we just watched, that we animals, we barbaric, and we savages, and that's how we being treated. So I think in a lot of instances, unless you're dealing with a white person who grew up around black people or who grew up in um, a not segregated setting, then you know that's their introduction to us in our culture is what they see on TV, what they, what they see of us in the media, which is a lot of times negative. Um, I think other cultures are white people in particular, see blacks and their stereotypes as what they want to see. Um, I think they already have this image in their head and they already dehumanize us as blacks in general, so they see these stereotypes and it just waters their ignorance. And they just, the stereotypes, we all have stereotypes, so they know what they are. But because they're stereotypes of blacks, they're going to make them stand with and it's just going to feed on their ignorance and they're going to accept it because they dehumanize us. They have been dehumanizing us since the beginning and that's just how it, that's how they want it to be. They don't want to accept the change. They don't want us to like evolve. So that's why, that's how I feel like they are just going to continue to feed into these stereotypes. Most of these people who like, organize these things where we have mammies of today are white people like they want it they want society to see us with these stereotypes they don't want us to evolve wow i would say um from therapist standpoint um this is what i spoke of earlier of the uh intergenerational trauma is that a lot of these things are passed on uh through the years and through the generation and what we have now is white fragility is, you know, we have uh, Caucasians that don't want to have the conversation because it's a guilt thing uh, and the fact that they feel embarrassed of it. And so for the blacks, though, it re-traumatizes us to relive this all over again. And so we, we, it's almost like a snowball effect. We can't get a hold of the snowball because it's moving so fast. And so what has to happen is we have to slow down and be able to process and educate one another, even other races. And so the problem is they're not educated. They can't, we can't educate them because we can't even educate ourselves. So there's a problem in itself in our communities. So it's all about educating because right now everything is being passed on through generation and generation. A kid, a five-year-old right now don't know anything about slavery. They don't know anything, the difference between white and black. They are the black kid to play with the white kid, the white kid to play with the black kid. It's what happens in your home. When you go back home, what does your parents teach you? And so now that's why we have five years, five year olds calling uh, a white five year old calling a black uh, five year old the N word. They don't know what that is, but it's been passed along. It's been spoken in their homes throughout their generation. So this, these are intergenerational traumas that we continue to relive. Okay, um, before we go to this next question, I would like to uh, introduce the uh, dopest school board member, um, Mrs. Cameron Muhammad. Um, she is over the UCU. Um, she was a little bit behind because she's always doing work and helping people in the community. So we appreciate you for still finding time in your day to be here. Now, uh, Kevin, you tapped into something that um, I wanted to bring up. Okay. And 
epigenetic trauma, right? What role does negative stereotypes, now this question is for the therapists and the adults, what role does ep epigenetic trauma play or negative stereotypes play in epigenetic trauma? Real quick before y'all chime in, can we get um, the cliff notes of what that is? Can y'all define that? Yeah, for sure, for sure. Thank you. So um, epigenetic trauma is basically trauma that's passed on through generation. So like your grandchildren may, may carry trauma that you once carried as a slave. Um, so they've done studies on it to, to basically show how accurate it is. Um, so a lot of us could be carrying on trauma that our ancestors have had, uh, maybe that our parents have had. Um, and a lot of what it comes to, so the question is how does stereotype, and stereotype yeah. lead to epigenetic trauma? Um, so I mean, kind of, it kind of goes hand in hand. It's like, for me at least, it goes hand in hand because the stereotyping creates trauma. Yeah. You know what I mean? So the stereotyping um, creates trauma, like we said before, you walking in those rooms and you're getting treated a certain way, or you, in, you um, internalizing the stereotyping and, and it's creating certain type of trauma inside of you. Like, could you imagine how, like they, they showed a quick scene right quick with a guy when he, with the black man he dressed, he had to dress up in blackface, even though he's already a black man. And then he had to put on the act, the, the sing and dance, basically. Like, could you imagine how those people felt after the shows? You know what I mean? Like, what they had to go through, like, you losing your dignity, you know what I mean? Just just to be treated a certain way, just to have money. You know what I mean? You had to go to a bar. He said it dude charged him $500 for his drinks. So, like, that's building up trauma inside of you. You know what I mean? Uh, there's certain things that is building up inside of you. So you can easily be passed that on. You can pass that on genetically, or you can pass that on, like Kevin said, just by being in a house and your child picking up on some of your tendencies as a result of trauma, whether it, it could be something as small as smoking cigarettes to help or drinking or reacting a certain way. Um, I know me and you have had plenty of conversations to where we talk about how, you know what I mean, you, 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 we whoop our children so bad that we don't want, because we didn't want the slave owners to do it because we know, it's going off topic a little bit, but we know, we know what would happen if they did it. So we did it ourselves. But then again, that's a form of epigenetic trauma because we still to this day think that's the form of, a correct form of punishment. So it's a lot of different ways it could lead to it, my bad. I yeah. didn't mean to talk too much. No, you, you're good, Steve. Uh, when we talk about epigenetic trauma, we have to understand that we've never uh, addressed the trauma from the start. Uh, since slavery, trauma has been continuous. Um, you, the slave master would take his female slaves and, and lay with them, and they, they would have many other kids. Uh, the husbands have to sit there and watch that or be a part of that. That never stopped. At, w at what point uh, in history do we know that someone has dealt with that type of trauma have stopped and say, I need to see a therapist. They didn't. So it continues to, to perpetuate itself from generation to generation. Quick story is I was 13 years old in the South and I experienced my granddad being treated like he was still a slave. So as a 13 year old, that I took that to heart and I became an angry kid because of that. And I looked at people differently. So stereotypes comes with trauma. So when you see things happen to your own culture, now we're getting into the racial trauma piece. So in the racial trauma piece carries so much that we, we just seeing a brother or a sister get arrested or uh, mistreated. If I see one of you guys get mistreated, I'm going to feel some type of way. So not even, not even knowing the whole story, but just feeling that way. So it's going to always continue to perpetuate itself until it's been called out and educated on. So I appreciate you guys for breaking down the definition of that um, because that's something that I feel we talk about a lot just amongst our team leadership program. It's just um, about how a lot of things have been passed down from generation to generation. And I think that when you mix the trauma that we have experienced along with the negative stereotypes, not only does that impact how people outside of people who are not people of color um, specifically black, how they look at us, but it also impacts how we look at ourselves. And then we don't realize how we are passing that self-hatred down as well. 
And I think that one way that we can try to tackle that, or hopefully with the next generation, try to rectify it, is by going beyond slavery. Because even though that is when we first technically started here, our inception in the States, we were so much more before then. And we don't talk about that enough, we don't educate ourselves enough about it, and then we don't educate the next generations as well. So again, I appreciate you guys for putting a definition to that because that, that's real. And when you have, um, you know, me just as a mother, um, thank God I didn't have to endure the inequities that the slaves did, and I say that very lightly, but thank God I didn't have to experience that firsthand. But still, when I'm watching the news and I'm seeing the Trayvon Martins getting shot down, I'm seeing all of this thing, all these things happening in our society right now, then my son, who's right over here, then I'm not even realizing how I'm trying to then, I'm thinking I'm protecting him, but then I'm instructing him on how to continue to go with the status quo and how to feed into that narrative. So that's something I have to personally check myself on all the time too. So. Okay, okay. So this question is for, for the youth. Um, what resources do you feel first and foremost, that we as a black community fail to give you in order to overcome these negative stereotypes of black people? And what resources or how can we create that so that you guys begin to see yourselves in a different light. And again, that comes to our community first and then everyone else because I believe um, it, starts, it starts at home. As, as Kevin was saying, you know, um, my home is, is, is a pro-black home. That doesn't mean we are anti-white, we are anti-anything else. What it means is we are about our culture, our culture, our heritage, and who we are and uplifting that above everything first. So what resources do you need from us as adults to ensure that you are proud of who you are? Um, I wanted to say like back to the whole, like with parenting and stuff like that and just um, like adults in our community, I want to say the whole stereotyping thing because the segregation stuff isn't just like different races separated from other races, but it's also within our community, like segregation and like colorism. And we all tend to like put those negative opinions on each other, which isn't really helping. So I feel like the um, being more open to each other, because we're not really inviting to each other. We have like this negative stigmatism and then we like really judge our own people before we tend to judge another race, and I feel like that's kind of depleting. Um, I'll say education, teaching us about these things, the mental health, like just letting us know, like acknowledging that like we have feelings too, you know, and like our mental health matters, and um, just letting us have our own opinion, like you know, you can you can like teach us stuff, but let us form our own opinion about things, and um, just supporting us and you know yeah uh yeah like along with Tazi said um just hearing out our opinions because a lot of the times when you're being taught something especially about something to the extent of this topic it's very force fit it's not something that comes up in a genuine conversation it's something like oh well don't do this well don't do that and it's just like well obviously you want to know why but it's like you know it's like well why shouldn't i do this and that and but it's not to be ignorant or nothing or not to be, you know, bogus and saying like and being defensive about it, but it's just a genuine concern like which also comes from us, you know, having that curiosity level which we do have and I feel like parents don't well some parents, not all of them, but they don't know how to teach that or, you know, give that without being force fed and all that. Um I would say honestly to continue to do what you guys are doing now. Um, and I say that because before I joined Yuku, my mom was literally the only representation I had. Now joining Yuku, I literally have not only peers of my age that is like 
Um, <laughs> not only peers of my age that's also educating themselves and learning, but also have role models um, in different ages that's educating me and also themselves and listening to me and guiding me in the way to use my voice. Like this right now, I've, um, I've always said like black counselors, I would not think that we had black counselors in Rockford, if we're being honest, and I'm literally shocked, and I'm happy to <laughs> say it, but and I'm happy to like know, but opening up resources and stuff, I appreciate that, and I think that will help, not just with like Yuku, but expanding it to like our schools and stuff, with resources and like mental health especially, we really do meet more black representation. Um, Go ahead. I also wanted to add that like with there's um like there is a realization that like as time goes on things changes but like you can still see like representations from the past and like every in day-to-day -day life now just in different uh forms and so like things that would have been justified in like an earlier period may not be justified now so i feel like it creates a distance between um, kids and parents because the way that they were raised were different than the way that like they raise us now or that if they do keep it the same, there's like, it causes friction in the relationship. Okay. Tell me one part in the documentary that stuck out to you and it's like kind of like seared in the back of your mind because every time I watch this documentary, um, it seems like it's a new image that's like stuck in the back of my mind and has me or forces me to think of things or look at things from a, a new perspective. So what in the documentary stuck out to you and what did you think from it going down the line? All right, um, I know this is not answering your question at first, but I'm gonna say the whole documentary. Um, it just, it sticks in my mind because it, it speaks to our whole, our whole experience as black people. Um, but really what stuck out to me, now that I've seen the second half of it, um, Bert Williams was the guy, um, and they were just talking about how he had to perform and going back to um, the two questions that I didn't get a chance to answer, it's all good. I try to see your head, not your heart. It's all good, it's all good, it's all good. Um, but as a black person with the stereotypes, um, and I wanted to elaborate off of my answer too, um, I mentioned the two stereotypes like the watermelon, watermelon and the chicken, and this other stereotypes where it's like as black people, it's like when you're in this space, it's, you just think about it. You know, When you're in a predominantly white space, you think about it, it's like I wonder what they're thinking about me. Um, you feel the need to perform. So I felt like Burt Williams was just like, I, I myself, I'm just an overachiever. I always want to be, you know, excelling. I want to be the top, you know. But as a black person in the white space, you, you just always have to perform. It's like, all right, I can't be lazy, you know, because I'll be seen as a lazy black person. Or it's just like, oh, well, maybe we won't invite him anymore. Maybe we won't invite other black people because you have to represent everybody. Every, uh, you have to represent the black people in this space. So. Um, to answer your question, that definitely stuck out to me because um, towards the end of his career, you know, that's when he started to change everything, you know, and, and um, I forgot the guy's name, but he was uh, speaking on the, on the, on the film, um, but how he was changing that narrative. So hopefully I answered your question, but yeah. So it was the mammy image for me and I know we already touched on it <laughs> slightly at on one of our meetings and it, it started such a, a good debate but it was in a healthy way because for me obviously I'm a black woman that's the experience that I identify with right and so with that it's such a a burden sometimes that we carry on our shoulders because we're depicted as being strong super women resilient which we are don't get it twisted However, we're also, we can be soft, we can be, you know, like feminine too. And it can be harmful for us putting that label because we're not allowed to be human. And a lot of times, like, <laughs> me and my son have conversations and I'm not, I don't want to tussle, so, you know, just 
just being transparent. <laughs> and he'll be like, dang, why, why are you so aggressive? Like, it ain't that serious. Why you always got to be so harsh? And I'm just like, I'm not aggressive, I'm passionate. And <laughs> I, I need more people in our community, but especially and just amongst ourselves, like black folks, we need to stop feeding into that narrative because, again, it's back to what we were taught, how we were raised, and we haven't had a choice but to present and, and show up that way in the world because it's been a form of protection, or that's how we saw our mamas, our aunties, our grannies, you know what I'm saying, like hold the family unit down. So to see us being ridiculed for being ourselves, you know, it, it hits a nerve, it can be triggering. Like I've had personal experiences in the workplace where there's been jokes, going running jokes about, you know, Aunt Jemima, like because I wore a hair wrap and stuff like that, you know? So it, that was really stood out to me and resonated and um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, I'll have to say the, uh, agree with Cameron and the over sexualization of black women and how we have to deal with this as black little girls being over sexualized by our own community mostly and how harmful it will be for us. Like we have to, like I said earlier, we have to look a certain way. We can't dress this way in front of people because you know, and how they just like, uh, described us is very disgusting and how they used us for their desires and, um, just you, you know, treated us like degraded us and made us feel. They made us feel, and it, it has um, today. It had it has um, like passed down to us, and how just how harmful it is, and how um, it can be on our mental health, and how it's looked over. Yeah. Uh, one part that stuck out to me was so there was a white man. He was doing blackface, and. Um, it was, it was what the lady said that actually stuck with me because what she said was, the lady that was narrating was, um, she was like, it was a space where, you know, the white man could cry, he could laugh, he could act, he could be himself. And it's just like, in a way, it's kind of a double meaning. It, it's like, it's like I thought of it as a double meaning behind why it was that they did that because obviously they were making a mockery of us, you know, they were diminishing our culture and everything, but it's just like, in a way, it's, it's, I looked at it as them being cowardly because especially being a man back then, we couldn't show that emotion. We couldn't cry. We, obviously, we could, you know, laugh, and, but it was more to what we felt than what society saw from us. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not going to say what he did was right, you know, because, but I, that was just one thing that I noticed from the film was just like, she could, oh, like, he could cry, he could do this and that, and it was just like, he had to do it under blackface, he couldn't do that as himself, so. Um, the, the scene that stood out to, to me in the film was um, when the guy had dressed as a blackface and how his, like, uh, pigmentation was darker than himself, and he brought up how uh, like he sort of had a narrative that pretty much portrayed how them making money and them in order to be successful that they had to break themselves down and pretty much belittle themselves and how it like really affected their mental state. And I feel like when he went into explaining the process and talking in his narrative and his story, like you could not only see like you could see his genuine emotion in it and how it like really affected him even if it wasn't like his time when it happened but like you can see that the fact that he even dressed like it really messed with him mentally and it's like the whole thing like when you see stuff today pretty much and that like has an effect on you and like you can just feel something like it doesn't have to be specifically affecting you but like you pretty much feel it and so I felt like him feeling it just really shows how much it affects us now. Yeah, uh, so it's probably like my 15th time watching this. So, but I, I, if this is your first time watching it or second time, I'd advise you to watch it again because it's one of those things that like you got to watch it multiple times to get certain things. So this is, like I said, not not really my 15th, but probably like seventh or eighth, and I still grab something new. And the one thing that grabbed me this time was um, obviously they talked about how when black actors were allowed in film, or even before black actors were allowed in film, when the white men were doing blackface, we were only cast as savages. Black men were only cast as savages. Uh, you see the white woman would rather jump to her death than to be captured by the black man. Uh, but then they, they 
they start to change the role a little bit and they made the one guy a noble savage. So he's in the circle of all white men and they shooting him. He's just taking all the bullets. Um, and it and it really it that that stuck to me because it's like in no way or form would they even would they allow us the space to be vulnerable, will they allow us space to be sensitive, kinda like what what you were talking about to express ourselves because now it's like Again, that's a stereotype because it's like, oh, now they can just, they can take 50 bullets. You can treat them. And we still see that today, as you were talking about, when you see the way cops treat us, you know, they still see, see, view us as like those noble savages. You know what I mean? They still feel like they can put their knee on someone's neck for 10 minutes and he'll be okay. They still feel like they can shoot and tase somebody to their death. And in their head, and they sick head, they still like justify that because of stereotypes. It was just... I know the point of this is to show how dangerous it is. So that's the point that really stuck out to me is the noble savage part because I think that's one of the main ones. A lot of them are still persistent today, but that's one of the main ones that we still see play out today. I feel like how us as black men are viewed. Um, a part that stuck out to me was when um, the narrator was reading a book and um, it was, obviously it's reformed now, but the five little monkeys and that it was that book just in a different form. And as soon as I heard them reading a book, any mini mighty mo catch a tiger by his toe just popped in my head because I automatically knew where it came from. And it's just like we change these things or they change these things to make it seem so like innocent and it's not. And we just I was singing that song as a little girl playing like and the fact that it just rooted from some evil is just so sad. And another thing with the um I'm gonna say the five little monkeys because that's <laughs> I'm just gonna say it like that. And the book from the documentary, they had the faces darker, bigger faces like mouths and stuff, making them look like monkeys, like in the like literally. And, and the black community now, a lot of the times, if you see someone and you ask if they're attractive, they're gonna say no. One of the reasons, top three reasons, too dark, big lips, big mouth. That's literally, they like portrayed this image of ugly, excuse me, of ugly and we just take upon it and it's just like in our culture, which it doesn't need to be, we need to like reroute ourselves and make and educate ourselves because we just keep taking upon these negative stereotypes and just making it our own and we don't need that negativity. Uh, well, first thing I would say is that um, America has painted this ugly picture of a beautiful culture. Um, I don't think that we could have fathomed the magnitude of how it would affect us. When I look at this film, one thing that stood out, because I'm such an advocate for strong intellectual black men, is that when he walks into the bar and he asks him for a drink, and he says, that would be, uh, what, $50. He said, well, I want 10 of them. No matter how hard as black men we work, we're still going to be viewed the same. And that depiction of being able to go in and even spend your money even as entertainers, as much as money as they make, as much as I do as a therapist, I'm still a black man. And I'm looked at differently. We as black men have to do more to, and accomplish more to say that we've arrived and we still haven't arrived. And we're gonna always continue to arrive until we all can come together as one and push our own culture but that still doesn't say that you live on an isolated island away from everyone else. But as Tony was saying, pro-black doesn't mean that we don't engage with the other culture. It just means that we put our culture first. And what is happening is, is no matter what we do, how much we do, we're still perceived as the same uh, black, angry black man or angry black woman. So that, that perception of, the, of uh, Burt Williams at the bar really stood out to me. Okay, and I told y'all she was dope. So she's been tapping in on a lot of things. So if you can fast forward to today's time, we've watched the documentary. Tell me something that depicts negative 
stereotypes or images of black people that you currently see today, but watching this documentary brought it to your attention as being the same thing, but just shifted to match the culture and the time. You gonna hit me with the new mammies? <laughs> yeah, Go because ahead. I think that if we look at some of the stuff that we consider to be entertaining right now, whether it be um, through TV or less even music, a lot of it is still negative stereotypes perpetuating. And we will mask it and be like, oh, it's for the culture, oh, it's a black thing, and it's just like, but is it really though? Because are we tracing it back to its origin? Just like Kanaya said, it, they're simple melodies right now. The ice cream truck, that derives back to slavery. And, you know, we, we have to be very cognizant of what we are um, engaging in and also just what we are um, ingesting. So when I just look at the entertainment industry, just all across the board, like, Medea, I'm sorry, y'all, D please, don't, don't meet me in a parking lot, but it makes me cringe at just the imagery that Medea and or you go on Instagram and you see all of these black men in wigs emulating black women and that's their like claim to fame. Um, they're social media influencers because they're making a mockery of these images that derive back from what's touched on in ethnic notions. Um, I wanted to touch on like how they said that they uh, portrayed like black men as like irresponsible and not really trustworthy and not really stable, like they wouldn't be considered the head of the household. And they pretty much left the woman to do all the work. I feel like that um, affects um, black women's uh, opinion on black men, especially when it comes to um, relationships and stuff like that, because it, like, it makes them undesirable by undesirable by their own race and you can see it in like uh, different TV shows like uh, Paternity Court or like Maury because typically it's a black like audience that it's projecting to and most of the time it is the black men that is uh, that is the father or he's already in there because he was in there multiple times for having multiple children and like not doing his job and stuff like that. And he's like not something you can rely on as dependable in the household. So most of our own race will tend to look away from them because of that. Um, I'll say how you'll see like a lot of white women and non-black women have, not yeah, non-black women have like the big butts and the big lips and the nose jobs. And like we um, get deemed as ghetto and all these other harmful words when they like they can wear braids in their hair, they change it up, call it boxer braids, um, like the Kardashian Kenner, um, and the Kardashian Jenner. You see how they like wearing J's, the big baggy clothes, and like how they took our culture and make it as their own. And when we try to claim it back, like we get deemed as ghetto when we when we do it, but it's okay for them to do it. They go in jobs, they um, you know, they make it a trend. Um, I feel like, uh, in a way, after especially after watching this, it makes it more easier to point out the simple stereotypes that I believe people uh, of um, non-black descent um, like view us in a way. Because this was an example that my old mother had gave me. Uh, she was saying how, uh, like, oh, was it, I believe it was a white woman that told her like, "Oh, you're so well spoken," or you're so smart or you're so this and just basically giving her all these little compliments and in a way she's thinking well why wouldn't I be and I feel like after watching this it made me kind of open up my third eye and look at it like oh well that's that's real life because I've gotten plenty of those those all oh, well good ants like like you know what I mean like oh well you're so smart woo woo you're like oh your hair is so long like this and that and it's just like and I never really looked at it differently until watching this and especially after you educated me and showed me how it was different and even in um like what y'all talking about with entertainment it's it's not usually implied that it is about black like even with king kong like you know what i mean okay. the example that you gave 
So, so can them. I speak on Go that, ahead. Tony, for a second? So, young man, what you're talking about now is what we call microaggressions. Yeah, we're talking about microaggression. Those are the subtle, aggressive thinking and thoughts that people of another race put on us. Uh, simple as, you know, they may pick up some earrings for a woman. Like they may say, wow, these are big earrings, and insinuating that black women wear big earrings. So those microaggressions are real, and they become more prevalent when it comes to trauma. Because uh, I've, I've noticed that a lot of young people are starting to deal with microaggressions but not actually knowing what they are and thinking they're being complimented when they're not actually being complimented. They're being mocked. I know you're not. What? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, last time we had this conversation, I had brought up um, the entertainment or performing, and I had brought up, like, you know, um, our star athletes like LeBron James or OBJ, and um, how, <clears throat> gosh, you can suck my bad, and how. On the basketball court, on the football field, you know, they're Michael Jordan. I mean, um, they're LeBron James or Michael Jordan or OBJ. But when they get off the court, and even Michael Jordan had experienced some of this, like, just racism, you know. Some people that don't watch sports, they may not know who they are from the next black man, you know. And just like Burt Williams, who Mr. Thomas was talking about, yeah, you may be able to afford this, but because you're black, we're not going to accept your service. You know, we don't accept your kind. Uh, but something new had popped up to me where in the beginning of the film, they were talking about how black people are only good for, you know, dancing and, and singing. Yeah. And they said they even danced and sung at the, at the auction block. And that resonated with me because there's nothing wrong with this, but I see a lot of that on social media where on TikTok or on Facebook or on Twitter, you see we're the ones coming out with the new dance. Or we can do this new dance so well. or you know, we in the stores or in spaces doing the new dance so well, but where are we at to, you know, be educated or, you know, to be in the boardrooms or to be, you know, in charge of legislative decisions and stuff like that, decisions that actually affect us and affect our voice. So that's what stuck out to me. Yeah, um, and just to piggyback off that real quick, a lot of times when we create those dances just in our, in our bedroom or whatever and they become the biggest rage, when it comes time to that dance goes national and they want to do it at a Super Bowl, they still, you, you reference this because they still pick a white face. They still pick a white influencer who has a huge following to do that dance, you know what I mean? Um, but what was the question again, bro? My bad. What was the question again? <laughs> everybody went, I'm last, but everybody no, no, went. <laughs> you okay. It was just basically how has this transcended into today? Into today? In what areas do you see the same thing going on today. For sure. Um, so, I mean, I think entertainment is the obvious one, So, and I think everybody spoke on that, but probably Kevin can uh, speak, to, speak on it as well. I see it a lot in mental health. Um, it's, a, it's a huge push to, to further black mental health, for us to, to start taking our mental health serious, for us to learn about epigenetic trauma, for us to learn about how just living in our community breeds trauma, um, our community is filled with trauma, we talk about that all the time. Uh, but yet, and still, when I see, I just seen an NFL ad the other day about um, mental health, and it's like, oh, I'm not all right, I'm not all right. It was all white women and white men, not not even a, not one person of color. So you still see it, you know what I mean? Um, and I think a lot of times you see it in performative acts, you know what I mean? Um, this NFL or NBA, something they get they get in trouble for something, and the next thing you know, they they signing this person to do this, and it's just a, it's just a, a a song and dance in a sense, you know what I mean, literally and figuratively speaking. Um, but yeah, I see it a lot in mental health. I I, th I just don't think from a lot of companies. I think they know, you know what I mean, that that we suffer from mental illness. And we was just talking about this earlier today uh, that a lot of us suffer from from certain mental illnesses, and they know that that could help, um, but instead is is you know what I mean? They don't. They don't put that first. They don't put that forward. They, hey, let's have this person come sing and rap and dance for y'all. We'll get y'all this at the halftime show, and it's all good. So, um, I think it's real prevalent in the mental health field. And can I just touch on one last thing? Go ahead. Um, definitely. And and I'm not saying that that's bad that we do that. There's nothing wrong with that because I believe back in the motherland we were singing and we were dancing, and it was that 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 was us, you know, and that still is us. But we must be mindful and critical of when and where to do it, you know, and that they can take it and they can run with it. And at the end of the day, we're not gonna get our shine. Right. And speaking on mental health, in the film I had seen too, when the Mammy figure um, was in the film, the um, Judge Priest, she was singing a hymn. And 
me, I was, I was raised in the church because I was always around my grandparents. And we had talked about mental health. We may have not had um, our mental health really structured and in a box and we didn't go and see someone, but we had different ways where we can express our mental health or express what we're going through. And we had did that in church, you know, and through song and through dance, you know, we, that, that space allowed us to let that out, you know, allowed us to breathe. Um, and not only that, but the family aspect, there, there may have been some aspects in the family where we were more together, where we could say we, we had that open space to, you know, actually lean on each other. But now through time, you know, all of that's breaking apart. It's being broke down and diluted. So um, that was also, I say, some form, some space of mental health. I think, uh, can I, I just, uh, I think um, we've come to a time where self-exploitation has been a thing for us as, as black Americans, is that we've found that we so-called free, and we feel that, okay, now that we're free, uh, that we have means to make a living for ourselves. But at the compromise of who we are as our, in our character, we, we would do anything. We get on social media, you know, we get on TikTok, and we explore ourselves in, in so many different ways, even on TV. We have uh, reality shows that exploit our, we, we, we get on there and we fight each other. Uh, Y'all know the uh, Real Housewives and all that? They, they fight each other and that's, they, we, they depicting of this is how black women behave. Or they sit around and drink wine, this is what we do, we just drink. I mean, so, and even in our music, and uh, you know, back then when they were signing rappers, unless you were talking about things that kill women, degrading women, you wouldn't get inside. So a lot of this goes back to self-exploitation and we feel that we have to do this in order to be relevant in the, in the country and that's not so. And, we're, and the ones that are actually doing what they need to do, we put them down as if they're nothing. So would you say that, do you, do you believe that we take on these roles and we rap and sing a certain way or dance a certain way out of need for survival or want? I would say I wouldn't use a blanket indictment on everyone. I think some are conscious enough to do it out of um, um, a need to educate their people. And then I think some do it just for the fame. Some just likes the attention, some just want to, and that's a self-image issue though. When you have a self-image issue, you see yourself differently than what you, know, you would wanna, th you wanna think. Like I can say, uh, I'm, a, I'm a great young man and I, I'm intelligent. But then the person on the other side from another race may say, you know what, he's a nice young man. He's supposed to be like that, and I would like for him to be like that, but he's, but he's black. So there are a lot of things that go on in describing or even separating the two from wanting and, and needing or choice or versus uh, survival. So it's just not a blanket indictment. Go ahead. I agree, I think it's both because we can be overly critical of like athletes because we don't normally live that experience. And in most instances, when you have a person of color, a black American who's coming from poverty, and then you see somebody that's waving this big check in front of you, then you feel compelled to have to do the song and dance, to have to put on this caricature in order to put your family on. You know, there's so much pressure and getting everybody out of the hood. Yeah. So I think in that instance, it's, um, you know, a, a need of survival. But then unfortunately on the flip side, um, we're in a society right now that's so obsessed with just likes, like cloud chasing, like just social media. It just, ooh, if I, if I wasn't involved in a community, I swear I would be off the grid because <laughs> some of these statuses that I see, some of these pictures that's being posted and you have people that's posting, you know, they didn't even brush their teeth yet. And they like, good morning, Facebook. And they just put in everything just on display. And that's a want right there. You want the clout. You want the attention. You know what I'm saying? So I know those are two extremes, but I agree. Go ahead. Okay. 
Um, from the video, something that um, transcends in today that I see is what was the scene where they kind of switched it up and they had like a, a action of like savagery, Sav whatever, y'all see what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> and um, they was with the music playing and like they were um, making it seem like they were like fighting and stuff. And it was like a form of um, entertainment and when I see that, I, it just makes me think of stuff like that we see on the new, not Rockford Scanner, like at Showplay 16, where all those fights and stuff, and then I just feel like that just, I just seen that when I, like, that's what came to my hair, like with Tilted and stuff, and they're just so quick to put this on the internet and not really know what's going on, but at the same time, it's like, as soon as you go to Showplay 16 and they say, you can't be on, be there, past eight without an ID or a parent, the first thing somebody's gonna say is, those black kids messed it up. Those kids did that. These blacks can't never act out, they can't act right in public. Like, stuff like that. And it's not just at the movies, Tilted, it's literally everywhere. And I feel like it comes from like, kind of the home, but also like, welcoming. I don't feel like we like welcome in like communities and stuff, like in the community. So when we get there, we already on like, we just on a lookout, we trying to, you know, we just watching out. And a lot of times, like um, Timberland said earlier, we're still segregated within our community. And there's just so much that we just gotta educate each other and like ourselves on because in reality, like, it's like, it's a war. Can I ask a quick question, Go ahead. please? Can I, you bring up a good point, it does happen. In a lot of spaces, um, I see it a lot in schools, and oftentimes, I've lost count of how many recordings that have been brought to me of different fights. And a lot of times, I, it seems like it's um, the teens who are glorifying it that are the first ones with their phones out, like, oh, you know. So, why do you think that is? Like, what role do you think that y'all can play, and maybe? Um, changing that narrative or not feeding into that? Me personally, like if, before, if like in middle school, I was always like, on go, I'm gonna argue, you, you come with me, I'm about to argue, whatever, we finna get into it. But now I'm just like, you're not even worth my time. Like in general, like for me, it's different because what I think about is school. You're not worth me getting suspended, falling behind in school. That's how I think it. Not everybody has that mindset. Not everybody cares about staying in school. So for me, if I see my friend about to argue, girl, come on, we're going to class. Like, just being the role model and a leader, taking their, I will literally walk my friend to class. Like, I don't care. I will snitch on you. Call your mom. We're going to class. Like, I'm just that type of person. Like, I'm not about to let my friend get into it. And even if you're not my friend, if I talk to you and I associate it with you, come on. Somebody not teaching you, so I'm gonna teach you. Like, that's kind of what we gotta do. We gotta like lead the way for each other. Can and I you make a, yeah, you can add. I just wanna say you make a very good point and I appreciate that because I think that is a small role that we collectively as a community can start taking in to no longer feed into that narrative. The media is already over sensationalizing us and depicting us in a negative way. So we need to stop also feeding into a lot of the um, negative attention too that comes along with our culture. I um, also feel like we don't have enough opportunities, uh, a lot of stuff to lose, if that makes sense. Like, I know, like, I'm in the NAACP, I have UCU, um, you know, I want to go to college, I want to get all these great things done. You go but, on. But, <laughs> but we have, um, like, some other kids who don't have that or don't have, like, mentors or, like, advocates for them. So, like, you know, they have nothing to lose, so why not? But, like, like Anaya said, if you see someone who's um, like into it, trying to fight, de try to de-escalate the situation. And I feel like the um, teachers and the administration, they're so quick to, you know, just give out a ISS or OSS without helping us or explain like, why is this not right? What can we do to help this, help you be successful in these school environments where you're supposed to be safe at? And I feel like we don't get, we don't have enough guidance um, and we need more representation because I feel like I will not, like, you, you don't understand me, so why would I listen to you? Like, you don't understand where I'm coming from, you don't understand my experience, so, yeah. Thanks. Um, I wanted to add, like, to Kim's question and um, uh, what Kanaya said, it was just the whole thing that with 
parenting and stuff like that and like the ignorance among our community there are so many parents that are like they're involved with like um, gang association or they were raised to the fact where they constantly had to like prove themselves to people of their own community or their friends and show that they're tough and so like the fights were like a sh like it's showing your dominance over the other person and then not only to the other person but to the whole school so like if you win this fight like oh he has hands or like he's like he's scary don't mess with him leave him alone but like it shows dominance but then it also depicts you as a threat and then it also belittles the other person and makes them seem weak so i feel like that's an issue and then to the everyday things in life like we didn't have access to certain things when there was segregation. And like you notice that, cause we have like three different Walmarts, right? Here and um, the one on the east side, not really many things are like locked up. And then, um, but the one on the west side, it does, it's not open 24 hours. It pretty much closes early and like everything is locked up. Like even the, like the underwear because they like, there's so many people that like steal and pretty much, and that's like boosters and stuff like that. And that's a bad representation of our neighborhood because it's not up to date. We don't have the same allowance as other Walmarts and different sides of Rockford and then like we don't have the access and we're pretty much treated it's like kind of animalistic like you can only be here within certain hours and the only way you can get this is if you call and ask for someone to do it for you because I don't trust you to do it yourself because you're probably going to steal or you're probably going to mess up the place. Um, another thing I wanted to say, because she just kind of, the last sentence you just said, like how um, the certain hours, now that I think about it with the movie theaters, um, I'm not going to lie. My mom, she's not about to go to the movie theaters with me, but my wife and her <laughs> mom are going to go to the movie theaters with her. So it kind of goes like at the certain hours, like um, if you don't have an ID, most parents, most black parents, I'm not even gonna say that, but I'm just saying most people like they're you know it's kind of like they're not going to go to the movie theaters. They know that they kind of like know that already because it goes along with the stereotypes. And um, it's like at this at this certain time, it's like it's shut down and it's only open to a certain few. Like when I went recently, I just seen all these like white pe um, people with like their little kids like. It's nine o'clock. Why your kids, you know, like at the movie theaters at this time, why is it open for, like, you know, it's just kind of, I, I kind of like how you said, like, um, it's basically for certain hours. And I think they took like the stereotypes and like put it within the certain hours. Okay. Like, so we are getting ready to wrap this up. But in closing, so the topic was I am not your stereotype. We all know that we are not negative stereotypes. We are not negative images. We are not who the world depicts us to be through media. We are the creators and founders of life. There's so many great things that come from us and as Kevin and Cameron tapped into our history is before slavery. Slavery is something that happened to us, but slavery is not us. So in closing, going down the line, if there was something that you wanted the world to know about black people, what would you tell them? We're resilient. We're definitely resilient. Um, we find a way. We make a way out of no way. You know, even when we down and out, it's just like, look, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use, you know, you. I'm gonna use the very little of what I have and make the best out of it. You know, um, and that's on every level. You know, um, every level. I gotta think a little bit more. Come back to me. Um, I'll say we have feelings. 
And um, what comes around goes around. And I feel like um, I'm very like into the church and, I, and God said, don't touch my anointing. Anoint it, so I feel like karma's coming. So, um, I feel like I want people to know that we are that we can be good at any and everything. You know, we're not just entertainment. We're can not can or are. Hmm? Can or are. We we are okay. My fault. <laughs> Uh, like we're not all football, basketball, soccer, whatever. We're not all sport players. We're not any form of entertainment. We can be a doctor. We we can um, be involved in a justice field or anything like that. Like we are not just a form of entertainment. That is not all that we are good at. Um, I want to say like the things that we've been through pretty much gives us like um, like a heightened sense of flexibility almost and the like allows us to um, perform um, like not perform but to carry out different things in our lives and like makes us uh, it's like easier for us to adjust to certain aspects pretty much um, I guess I'll just say we human I know somebody said that but we you know we just we human bro we all the same way we, we came into this world the same. For the most part, you know, our, our bodies are the same. Our bodies and brains, we function the same. So we all the same. So that's why for me personally, I have no interest in uh, trying to appease white people. <laughs> I dress how I want to dress. I say what I want to say. You, know, you mentioned earlier the, uh, the hair wraps. I'm all for a black woman wearing hair wraps in public. Do your thing. Uh, just be you. We human. Um, and, and I, you know, I would say don't spend too much time trying to appease white people because whatever perception they have of you is has been built up on years and years of media, years and years of them being raised on that. So, I mean, be yourself. But, you know, I think we just continue to show that we can we can show up in those spaces with a hair scarf on. So I'm not ghetto. I can show up to work with Nikes on if I want to. I can do what I want to do, say what I want to say. Well, not do what I want to do, but I can dress how I want to dress and listen to whatever I want to listen to and still show up in those spaces and com compete. Like my my young brother said here, just as good or if not better, like Timberland said, because of a heart and sense than than anybody else. So, yeah. Um, I would say that we're loud. Um, loud has a negative. Um, it just turned into this negative thing, but it's not negative. Like I am loud. It's okay to be loud. Rather it. And our silence is also very loud. We're loud. LeBron James is loud on the court. Um, Martin Luther King was loud when he had his dream. Like, we are loud. It's okay to be loud. We need to appreciate the voice that we have. There's Maya Angelou was on mute for how long? We are loud. She was loud when she was writing. Like, it's okay. We need to um, embrace our loudness. Um, I would like to uh, just say that we're not different. Um, pretty much what Dennis said also is that we're resilient. What a person says about you, um, it's not your responsibility to prove them right. So let them have their opinions, let them have their stereotypes, but we don't have to feed into that. And I think that's the biggest thing that I think we should all take away from this. Because no matter what a person says about you, their opinion is their opinion. You have one too. Don't, don't spend time wasting your time trying to be responsible for their, their treatment, their answers, and how they, they view you as a person. Be you. Well, in closing, I hope this panel discussion was insightful for everyone that was here. Hope the documentary, Ethnic Notions, was good. And I see Miss Cam, I forgot. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Please forgive me, Don't Queen. Me, Tony. Don't um, me. <laughs> we are going to let Miss Cameron end on a uh, high note. I know she has something great because she let everybody go so she can get the best answer. Go ahead. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm just encompassing what everybody already said. You guys said it so eloquently. And I just want the world to know that we are not our trauma. That does not define us. We are actually black joy. We're the opposite of that. And I got that actually from um, an internal meeting that I just had at um, my job that was led by Jessica Aladapo. Her The name of her presentation was actually Black Joy. And she just talked about just how we just can enjoy just being, 
just being human, being resilient, being loud, being angry, whatever the case may be. Like we don't, we're not looking for pity from society. We're not looking for your sympathy. We don't need no handouts. We clearly know how to, we know what we need. We, we are resilient, like Dennis said, we're able to um, do whatever we put our mind to. So as people are trying to be allies or advocates or trying to do their internal work, I encourage you to do your thing, but at the same time, don't look at us to be your teachers either. That's not our job to do that, so. Thank you, shout out to J.O., um, one of the dopest professors that uh, I've ever dealt with. Um, so again, thank you, we appreciate you coming and we are looking forward to having more panel discussions uh, here at the Nord Loft. Again, thank you, uh, Mary Pat, for uh, opening the doors for this. All right, thank you. Everybody have a great night.